So, hello and welcome to the Red Room. Today we hello. have with us again Griffith Morgan, who is our guest for the second time. I think the first time it was two months ago, maybe. I yeah, don't know. it was ages ago. Three months ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It looks like a, it was a long time ago, but it wasn't. Three months at tops. I don't know. I'm not sure. You were I'm one of the. Yeah. Actually, I think Venger got better viewers than I got. I'm kind yeah, of pissed off. Yeah. I'm kind. Yeah. Of, I'm in a race with Venger. We're gonna <laughs> Venger, <laughs> Venger. Meanwhile, like, you were uh, surpassed by Gabor Lux, also an Hungarian yeah. game designer. Bastards. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, we talked about getting back together and just talking about sort of specific subjects in uh, in gaming. Um, I just wanted to mention, I'm just back from Gary Khan, so I sent you a couple images. You can pull mm -hmm. them up full screen and show the sorts of things I did. Um, got a chance to run Tonisborg. And the best part is that I, uh, I know you guys aren't into dungeons, but it's, it's just, you haven't- We are, cha to, we are changing now. The old ways. You're changing we have, now. We have to, we have to. We have to be into dungeons. <laughs> yeah, it's kind be of the thing. With the cool guys. Where was it? I was on level four, and uh, it seems like every time I run this down on level four, um, oh, I was using the McGarry maps. There's some. That else. is the anyway, new book. What's that? The, the the book is that the new one? Because I think the one that you showed the other time was blue. Or maybe it, oh, was, it was my was screen. Purple. Yeah, no, the purple. cover. The cover yeah. is enough. Yeah, this is. Yeah, I, I have. Different. Uh, different colors there are, there are ah, different okay. colors okay yeah there's we made uh we to make ourselves feel special we made 25 black <laughs> ones for the people that worked on the project so but, but it wasn't um only 25 of those uh three months ago or whatever it yeah was. we still it have we're gonna we're about to print the uh pre-orders oh, yeah. okay um so people can still get in on that um anyway i was just really excited because i was at gary con and it was just like a marathon it, it's always I call it the suicide drive to Gary Khan because it's like a 14 hour drive. And then because I take breaks, I have I don't know, I must have some sort of sleeping disorder uh, about an hour of driving and I have to. Why, walk why don't you fly there? Five minutes. You can why don't fly? I fly there. Yeah. It's just expensive. It's really expensive. And then and then you have to basically fly into Chicago and then you have to rent a car. Oh, so it becomes really expensive. Mm -hmm. But um. Um, lots of excitement. I got to the, meet, uh, I don't, you probably don't know who Luzaki is, but he was the guy who first started making dice for D&D. &D, um, oh yeah, I, for D &D. I saw a picture. Oh, cool. And uh, that's so what I got the guy was, uh, got a, an award, right? Yeah, I guess he got an award. I was surprised. I but saw I that, a picture of him. I have always sworn by the, by the, uh, Luzaki dice and he didn't have very many of the crystal ones with him mm. which are my favorites and so I bought all these dice and I'm just like a little kid when it comes to <laughs> but they have to be game science you know and I actually like bought them directly from Lou at the he was he was in the booth oh. himself <laughs> and he's about 800 years old and yeah it looked us. the man in the picture looked uh, yeah very old but I'm I don't know. You've probably seen me post like this one might be iridescent. Like it's kind of one color, but you turn it and another color appears. Yeah. But I am just an addict of these dice and I'm probably not even going to use these to game. <laughs> these are just going to go in a jar. Yeah, anyway, they're too pretty to use. They are, aren't they? I mean, they're just, you can't, it's hard to see how pretty they are, but they're just like, I show them to somebody and they thought they were made out of glass. They're that shiny. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, gaming. We're going to talk about gaming. I think it's, well, it's, we should talk about your experience in Garycon also. Really? Well, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so. For me, okay, well, I I didn't get the car I needed to use because my car is old and beat up and would die. So I didn't get it till about three in the afternoon. So I decided I didn't want to spend the money on a hotel room and I would just drive and go to sleep in the car somewhere. And so at about two in the morning, about eleven hours into the drive, I I passed out in the back seat for about fifty minutes. And then I woke up and then I drove again. And uh, and by that point, I mean, it was like a good two hours. And then it was like, oh, I got to get out. And then an hour and I got to get out. And, and it just became this sort of like an hour max. And I like I stopped in a rest stop and ran around the car about 10 times to try to 
get myself awake. And I showed up there at about maybe 10 o'clock. First person I ran into actually that I know was uh, David Wesley. And um, he was sitting in a room without a COVID mask on. He's all vaccinated. He doesn't care. Um, and uh, what else happened? And I was just tired. So I just, I was in a delirium. I wandered around a little bit and I slept in one in the, there's a room called the Legends of Wargaming where they do all the old games. And I became part of the Legends of Wargaming because I was the lump that was snoring and sleeping in the corner for about a half an hour. And, uh, and so a little while later, I had to run my first game, which I, I just kind of forgot that I was going to go to Gary Khan. So about four days before the convention, I had a call from Paul Stormberg and he said, you, you accepted your ticket on the interface, right? And I was, what ticket? And he's like, for Gary Khan. And it dawned on me that I had to be ready for this whole thing. So I spent three days just manically preparing things, printouts and things. And um, what do I have here? Maybe these are the maps. Nope, these aren't the maps. Anyway, I was just like not prepared. Um, and then my printer decided not to work. So half the stuff is printed wrong because I switched computers, but I'm digging around in here because the big exciting thing was that I got to play. This is my, my excitement. I love the old games. We got to play mm -hmm. Fletcher Pratt's Naval War Game, which I heard about it when I started researching. Um, I think uh, maybe John Peterson had written about it in his book. And I was curious about you know how it related to D&D. Um, what it has is a system where basically it has a hit point system so it's considered to be one of the sources that brought hit points to Dungeons and Dragons and all, well, all the games. Um, but what's the coolest thing about it is that you get, ooh, here's the war spike. Okay. This is not one of the biggest ones, but um, you play it with these giant lead ships and they're just, I mean, this is, this is gigantic. You know. Where's the camera? There's the camera. Yeah. Um, they're beautiful. And so you play it on the floor with those and uh, you go out and you blow each other's ships up and it's just fun as hell. Like, I think a lot of people don't think they would like war games, but if you played something like this, it's, it's really fun. I had uh, most of the people playing were role players that are wanting to explore what the old war games are like. And so, uh, and they seem to be having a blast. And the other thing I do when I run my games is I, I, sort of let the players learn, like help me understand what the rules are as we go along. <laughs> so they were reading the rules too. I, I understand the basics, but I couldn't remember every detail. Um, and so when I do demonstrations of the old games, it's sort of a session of everybody getting together and pondering exactly how it should be played, which makes everybody get very uh, invested in what's going on. And after a while, like I, you're, the way the game works is you, you move your ships, you just move them on the floor, okay? Then you take a little marker and you point an arrow and you say, I'm gonna shoot my main cannons in at that ship in that direction. And you, you guess at the distance. And then you say, from that distance, I'm gonna do a salvo of eight shots and they'll be a half inch apart. And so you create this ribbon of shots. And so you measure it out and you place markers there to see if it goes across the ship model. And then, um, so it's a very physical sort of feeling uh, for people. And, and it's supposed to be the referee who does all the measuring and all of that. And I just say like, okay, you guys take over, you know? And so I let them do their own refereeing. And so uh, I have a bunch of photos where they're really like, oh my God, you know, what's gonna happen here? Um, so I did that, um, trying to think what other exciting things. There was so much, you know, it's just, it's like, it's overwhelming. Um, I don't know. Do you guys go to your local conventions? I assume you yeah. do. There are, there are well, there is one, but it's very, very small. I don't know if there is. Yeah. It's basically a, a board game convention, but it has a space for uh, role-playing games. It is a very yeah, small talked, space. You mentioned it last time. Yes, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. so. Yeah, Portugal um, has a very small community. 
So how, how many people? I mean, you're in a big city, right? Aren't you in? We are Lisbon? near Lisbon. Yes, we are near, near Lisbon. Lisbon. But yeah, it's but in they're Lisbon. not. Yeah, there's yeah, there's in Lisbon the convention, but there's not lots of people. Actually, I was thinking about it because I knew we were going to talk to you and going to talk about GaryCon. And that time that we went to the convention, it was actually actually because Miguel had just sold some old uh, books. Yep. And uh, uh -huh. we went to deliver them. And by coincidence, it was at uh, the convention was at the uh, physical uh, p pavilion on my from my old uh, high school. So the place oh, really? where we do the gen <laughs> yeah the gymnastics class. And so the board game was in the basketball courts. That was really the board games, the part of the convention. And the the <laughs> role playing games were at a small room. That is where we used to do gymnastics. So we have that smell of sweat in the <laughs> old sweat in yeah. the in the woods. Oh my god, oh my a bit god. disgusting. Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah, I that really... sounds great. I don't even know how many people play. Uh, the... Next time, bring incense or something. <laughs> yeah, you know, so you can have Miguel was like, smell. "Oh, this smells bad," and I was like, "This always smells bad. It's not the role it's players." Short shoes. Yeah, I was. Yeah. I was Heat wondering that it and... it could be uh, the role players. Some of them are a bit. Smelly. Oh yeah, you got to kind of smell. But but no, but yeah. that was really the. the it was smell probably of the me place. that weekend. I didn't <laughs> bathe and you, at a distance. Yeah, you were at the 14 hours in the, in the car. Yeah, yeah. After my 14 hours, you know, it's pretty crusty um wow but how many people show up at that i'm not sure probably not many uh perhaps uh, board gamers uh i think there are more board gamers here than, than role-playing gamers i don't know i'm not sure uh for really? example the the gr facebook group for uh, lisbon it has about uh, 1500 people that's not much no it's not, not. huh oh, so, that's too bad i mean lisbon sounds like an absolutely beautiful city like why you know like yeah probably think... it's sunny and the beach and people don't want to role play they want to go to the beach okay yeah yeah <laughs> well, no, when well, i started to do the... it in the winter time <laughs> well yes you know? um i don't think it was uh it was never promoted i don't uh, probably that's that's the problem I, I think uh yeah it's always the promotions that are a problem mm -hmm. yeah. we had the same problem with a local convention um we contacted them we were like you know we're secrets of blackmore we're a big deal we're going to come show our movie and and run games and you know we're going to be part of the, the community i hate that word community um but uh be part of the thing what, what about family thing. family's family. worse. Uh, <laughs> yeah I, I, there was an old like punk anarchist uh, slogan that was something like uh, unity through diversity and i really like that more than anything like the real diversity where you can be whatever you want to be and nobody gives you crap um um anyway yeah we we thought they would be really helpful we sent them a bunch of stuff we i actually made a video for them to help promote their their convention i animated their logo and stuff i like put in a lot of time to help them they never put anything on their website that we were going to be there <laughs> they didn't post it on their social media on their website nothing so we got there and we set up to do the screening and no one showed up like this is our hometown right and it's our home local convention nobody shows up to our screening it was just like okay we're never gonna go to that convention ever again and i talked to other people that went to the local convention that were from out of town and they were like yeah the people that run that are so arrogant and you know like like they were trying to be polite and i was like it sucks doesn't it and they were like yeah <laughs> you know so um I don't know what can you do to make a better like i think for you guys it's almost like if you want a better convention you have to do it yourself yeah that's a small there's another one a smaller one the hall of lisboa but uh, the people that do it it's also not very big but it's more uh, they're more into narrative games and stuff like that i would say okay. most of the people what is a narrative game i don't even know uh, is. is those games Sorry, games Yes, basically they end up being story games. Yeah, you probably never played anything of them. nothing like that. Never, never. Yeah, you know, you well, I the... keep hearing about it, and I'm like perplexed. You know, so, yeah. like, like people know. are so arrogant about what they do. Like, I'm oh, not really sure that. if I can explain it because you can explain right. the forge the, when it started, right? Do, do you remember the that? Forge the forge. It was a what forum, it? a game forum called the Forge. Uh, I've heard of it. I think probably. But is it sort of like connected. the linear solo dungeons where you read a passage? And it's like you get to the end of the passage and then you go like okay you can do a b or c is it sort of railroaded like that like a like a written out story uh, 
it's not quite time. <laughs> okay, we should just move on. Yeah, that's what it's fine. I think they have rules for uh, social interaction, interaction and stuff like that. You need rules for social interaction. Yes, and yeah, the Game Master so. can't do, for example, in the Power by the Apocalypse, because one of the most famous ones. So the Game Master has moved. So the Game, the game Master or the referee can't say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. He, needs, he can only do some things at specific moments. And the players must be, it's like the players are building the story. Some of those right. games don't even have a Game Master. A story, yes. Yes. Sometimes they don't have a Game Master. They, they, uh, right. Everybody tells a bit of a story and they... Yeah, and they are building the oh. story, but out of character, right? They're not exactly yeah, playing. Yeah, it's mo mostly out of character. They are it's planning a... what's going to happen. So it's more like they are storytelling. So it's kind of a, mm -hmm. uh, oh. a, a game that is, uh, uh, well, it's like um, a strategy thing, but uh, in, yeah. in terms of rules, but uh, to, to construct story, not war. So it's uh, something. That sounds really tedious. Uh, yeah. yeah, it is. Oh, look what I got. I've got my Gary Khan cup. <laughs> That's the... I only got the dice and I only got the cup. That's all I have. Um, no, it's funny. You, uh, the other thing I wanted to show you, just to backtrack on the Gary Khan thing, and I don't know where I put it. Uh, I made a map and it's just beautiful. And I don't know where I put it. I'll remember in a little bit. I, I, I can share the crap. can share one of the pictures in the. I can the imagine screen. the oh, yeah. amount of things that you have around you. <laughs> Just I do. I have too many hobbies. Yeah. Not, I'm you know? not sure where they where I put I, them. Like my sister just gave me an old synthesizer. It's an old Casio, and I'm all excited. I'm gonna run it through this little, little pedal here and just destroy the sound in it. I'm just just thrilled. But uh, yeah, put up that. I think there was one of um, the people the playing. One, yeah, in the last battle one, in one the of skies. the battleships. There was the one, That's the colorful really one, with the battle in the skies. There we go. On the bottom, lower side, yeah, yeah, yeah. the guy Blue with the mask the... on, and the man with grabbing the dice. That one, um, can you click that up full? Well, uh, you said yeah. where, where, here? The 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 it's below punk for us. Yeah, below what? <laughs> punk. We are seeing punk, and we are seeing your transferences. So it's the one with the maps. Okay, so you are not seeing the pictures. No, I'm we not. See I'm seeing we the... see four images. Yeah, we're seeing there. four images. Two mm. pictures, a folder, and. Oh, okay. Uh, the lower of yes. the of the two photos. I thought I was. I don't know. Yeah, I can you're share not this. sharing. Yeah. I can yeah. share a picture. I think. <laughs> I'm. I'm put it. Be, I'll put it behind me. It's easier to do that. <laughs> Yeah, that was embarrassing because the For folder some... said something like Miguel's Deviant Porn Collection. Oh, yeah. No and problem. even saying the name of the folder was horrible for me. I feel violated. I'm going to need okay, to do no, this yeah. That's not the, yeah. That... It's be... Hey, look, you're playing Blackboard <laughs> with me. <laughs> yeah, you are on top of the table. I had yeah. no idea you were there. I was there. <laughs> yeah. The first um, anyway, I made this beautiful map. The other photo that was in there. I made this beautiful map um, and that was really exciting. That's always exciting. We play battles in the skies on like this really nice colorful map. Yeah. Is this the map? Um, yeah, the map? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, you just need to like get out of your chair and leave or something. Yeah. <laughs> Go away, but I made that in Photoshop and printed it up with glossy paper and, you know, um, do a little do it yourself. It's square hexes where they, in the old days, it was easier to just make a row of squares and offset it half. And so you create the same effect as hexagons because you have like, you don't have mm -hmm. the, the grid. You can't cheat on the grid and go diagonally and get an advantage in distance. It's, it's going to be the same combination of squares to get anywhere, like in a hex sheet. Um, yeah, I ran that and that was really fun. And that was another game where I didn't really remember what I did the previous time. And it's, it's sort of two manuscripts in one, the old rules that Arneson had created. And so, uh, um, I got I got that one handy. Um, it's like you know the stack of papers that he sent to Gary Gygax that was supposed to be part of the Dungeons and Dragons game that was the flying combat. And so it has. I mean, it's it's so cool because it has like um, these or any printouts of that. Maybe not. Page number. Let's guess. There's a page where Arneson drew little figures. And it's just, it's just cute as hell because it's like 
here's the guy who invented D and D and he's not a great artist, but he's trying to be a fantasy artist. And so you just got to give him credit for like, you know, jumping in and trying to do it himself. Like, yeah, yeah it's not like, bad. I've seen worse. Then by yeah. computer. <laughs> so I took those and I scanned them all and I put them in Photoshop and made little counters for people to play the game with Dave Arneson counters. Um, so yeah, that was the other thing I ran. I ran three things. I ran Thomas Borg just to do a demonstration of the old way. Um, I sent you that image you put up of the, the first one you put up of the mm -hmm. people playing. Mm -hmm. um, I just keep evolving how I run my games and, and adding things in. And so I, I don't know if I told you about the, the Blackmore Tarot deck I created. I don't think so. I think you mentioned it, uh, but it was on message. Yes, yeah, so we I can do say like it on a video. Big, yeah, I do a big reading. Like I, I, what I did was I integrated sort of the storytelling. What they're, what you're talking about, the storytelling, but I integrate it into the experience. So, the players start, and I tell them they're on their way to the tavern, and this little girl comes up and tugs on one of their coats, and they look down, and she's just filthy, like a little street urchin. And the thing they really notice is that she's looking straight at them, but all she has for eyes are the whites. There are no pupils or, or, or irises. Um, and she tells them that they, you know, her mistress wants them to come talk to her. And so they arrive at this place and there's a single, you know, it's low and they have to stoop to go into the door. And it's this kind of cramped room and there's a person sitting on the floor and there's just one beam of light, you know, and, and it's so smoky and that, that the beam of light is like, like sort of like the light in a, I don't know, it's just like it becomes this solid thing as it travels through the, the smoke from all this incense that's been burning in there. And, and all they see is this crack of light across this person's eye. And it's the brightest thing in the room. And uh, it turns out this person is like a soothsayer. And so I read them. She tells them that her helpers are speaking to her and that they've told her that, you know, she needs to find them and send them on a mission. And uh, so then I, I she goes into a trance and I read them all this background on the history that's like they have to know the background in order to go into the future. And uh, so I read them a little bit of my story background about Blackmore and the ancient elf, the, the ancient times before the humans arrived. And then, uh, and then I had this deck of cards and she's like, I, you know, before you go on your mission, I need to read your cards. And so I do a card reading for the entire group with these cards that I made up. And that was really fun because I have a, a piece of fabric that I lay down like a diamond and I put the stone down and then the feather. And then I have them draw a card for one for the stone, one for the feather, which the stone is sort of like the concrete, what has happened. The feather is sort of a mix between the future or maybe what is in your head or what is in your dreams. And um, so I spent... I probably spent an hour just on preamble stuff. It was very, uh, I wanted to prep them up with the experience of what, you know, it's not, we're not just gonna go into a dungeon and just do the same old thing. We're gonna, you're going into the world of Blackmore. And so I'm gonna let you know what the world is and, and, and give you this sort of other experience. Um, where was I going with that? Yeah, so I ran that. I don't know, that was fun. You know, I, one of the guys that I played with had never played and he, sent me a message on Twitter and said it was the best game he's ever played, you know, so whatever. I did something right, okay. Um, I ran that, I ran uh, the, the Fletcher Pratt with the big ships and then the thing that's behind you, mm -hmm. the uh, Battle in the Skies game. And then I did a screening for the movie. So I was pretty busy. All of those events were about four hours long over three days. And then on Sunday, I was fortunate enough I was going to leave uh, late Saturday night so I could get home or drive maybe four hours and sleep and get home. And um, Wesley really wanted to talk to me and spend time with me. And so he invited me to his Brown, uh, Brownstein game, which it was the Banania version, which is the South American country with the despotic rulers and just everybody is corrupt, you know. Um, and so I got to play again. He lets me always play the same character. I played the man from Imperialist Industries, the American, and uh, and I just had a blast. It was just hilarious fun. I watched the the trick with games like that. You know, they, they're competitive games. Everybody's got information, some sort of lever against somebody else. Um, but what you have to do is create your own levers. 
And so I was watching the players. There was the, the leader of the secret police, the, the general of the army, the general of the, of the Marines, the little Bananian uh, Navy, and the general of the Air Force. They all started colluding and they'd go out in the hallway and talk and come back, oh, all happy, like, oh, we're all gonna win this together, right? If we just cooperate, we'll win. So I had meetings with all of them. And in each meeting, I informed them that there was a conspiracy to assassinate each of them. <laughs> they would, <laughs> it was hilarious to just watch their faces kind of go. But you were mentioning uh, Air Force. Isn't that yeah. fantasy? Isn't that the game of fantasy? I Banania it isn't. Oh, okay. Banania yeah, isn't. Yeah, it's Banania set in, is in the, the 1950s. Yeah. It's like a fictitious South American yeah, okay. banana republic. Um, and so it was just funny because they went from this elated, we're going to team up, we're going to win the game together because everyone can win. Whoever win, achieves their goals wins um, to this feeling of like, oh, I have an army, but somebody wants to just kill me, <laughs> you know, and um, none of it was true. I just made it up, you, you know, and can, I had them the minute I told them that they all got really paranoid. <laughs> And I've played other games and the army comes charging in and they, they wage war on the peasant, the, 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 the workers unions, the farmers union and the banana pickers union. And to suppress them, they bring in the army and the air force for that. And this time the army and the air force just left them alone for some strange reason. The generals were scared to go over there. And uh, um, yeah, it was just funny. I just, you, you know, if you don't have a lever in a game like that, you can just create your own, make people paranoid, tell them things. Um, and so I managed to actually, for the first time, win playing that character and or win. I didn't get killed. I always get killed. <laughs> so I got out of the country safely. Um, but it's amazing. I think that uh, and I talked to Wesley about that. We're going to do a uh, we were having trouble figuring out how to approach a workflow for creating a book on how to, how to play Brownsteins. And so uh, we talked and I realized that he wanted me to jump in as an editor and, and actually be more like a co-writer. And so I might just have like the second, second authorship on the mm -hmm. book when we get it done, as opposed to just being the editor on it, which is fine by me. I didn't, I just didn't want to, I'm very polite. I don't want to step on other people's creative endeavors. Um, I just want to, as an editor, I just want to assist them in being clear in their prose and, and uh, you know, making sure all the components are there. I don't know if you heard about, there was a game recently that was released and they completely neglected to put a combat system in their RPG. How is that possible? I, I don't know, right? What's the game? Uh, I can't, I won't talk bad okay. about them. I think they fixed it, <laughs> but it was something that was talked about. I'll tell you later. I and then yeah, yeah, half yeah. the people here not, probably know I can't about remember, it. Yeah, people I already think heard know. about it, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember also, but... I Maybe been yeah. distracted. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, and then other things happened. I just don't talk negative stuff. I had some negative experiences having to do with uh, basically someone pirating our movie and using it as a promotional tool for their own endeavor. And they're so small that I don't even feel like it's worth the effort to proceed with legal anything against them, um, at least for now, you know, but they're showing segments of our movie and using it to somehow promote themselves. I don't know. Um, I'm starting to find out I'm, I'm very much labeled a toxic, horrible individual on the internet because of my uh, bad sense of humor, maybe. I don't know. Uh, yeah. And my, my sort of indifference, I don't give a snot, right? I'm old. That's the best thing about getting older. You don't give a snot. Um, um, so yeah, I don't know. That's kind of things that happen in Gary Khan stuff that happened all around. The convention is always amazing, you know, um, trying to think of other just cool things. I don't know, like I, I took a break from running a game and I was in the hallway and I ran up and I was gonna buy a scotch and the guy standing next to me is like, oh, Griff, I'll buy your scotch for you. And I was like, who are you? And he's like, it's Kurt, you know, and I'm like, Kurt. And I look at his little tag and I'm like, oh, you're Kurt Roche. How nice to see you. You know, I don't know, you meet so many people online, you don't know their faces. <laughs> So it's so sweet of Kurt to do that. And then um, I kept running into Robin Irwin a lot. He's just like a super duper happy and hardcore gamer, you know? And then like people like, uh, I don't know if you know who Michael Mornard is, but he's famous for, 
he had he was friends with Gary Gygax and was in Lake Geneva. And when he had to leave, Gary gave him like just a basic outline of the D and D rules to take with them. And, and they're now known as the Mornard fragments. That was just a very incomplete draft of rules. And um, so he went to college in the Twin Cities. And then later on, he worked for the the Tecumel division of adventure games which Tecumel is now you know nobody wants to talk about <laughs> let's talk about it <laughs> well, I don't, what can you say it's like the guy was a yeah. racist i'm sorry i don't approve of that either you know but i love his game yeah you know it's like the guy that invented the transistor okay uh what the hell was his name i don't remember his name you know he late in later life he supported eugenics and things like that he was you know in 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 old school terms we call that person an asshole and he kind of became a big a-hole and but it's like nobody's not using transistors exactly. right They're, yeah, it's we're, like we're talking about that the other the day two. so if the guy who invented the toilet was a right. an awful person are you going to shit in the yeah. woods you are right are you gonna yeah or in your yard i mean yeah. you know the suit yeah exactly so, okay the the guy was a uh, nancy or whatever yeah it's kind the of, game I mean, has nothing to do with that the game is yeah. different. The game is a. It's hard. I mean, I you know I'm a huge Tecumel fan, and um, for me it was a really huge blow to hear that. You know, I was just I was so disappointed to find that somebody that I admired so is it um, highly. Are people so sure about it, or is just is it just a <laughs> rumor? A rumor. Yeah. Oh no, there's like ev all this evidence. They've got receipts for the payment for him writing the book. Um, he was involved in groups that were promoting these uh basically white supremacist ideas you know um so i don't have anything good to say about that you know i'm not a raging uh social justice warrior but i don't approve of racism i mean i have you know i mean in america it's bad so people in you know in america it's like the the people who came over were puritans originally and and so there's these layers of of white folk coming over um, the people who went down to like South America were were Hispanic. They were more Latin, but you get into America and you get more Germanic people. And so even when my people, the Italians show up, they're like, we don't want these dirty. I mean, you look at them, they, their skin is dark and they're, they, they don't bathe. They're, they're unclean. We don't want those, you know, those inferior, not white people here. Uh, it's always, you know, wherever you are on the spectrum, you're going to say the other people are the bad people, but I'm with you guys. Um, so yeah, I'm just, you know, I don't know. What are you going to say about that? I just don't yeah. approve of the whole racist thing. Yes, of course. But I think, okay, but the game, is the game racist? Because we had that if the game is not racist, then it really shouldn't matter, especially because he already is, he already uh, died. So yeah, yeah, he's not going to make, make any difference. Money. Yeah. Yeah. He's not going to make any money. Um, you know, I think a lot of the Tecumel people, the older Tecumel people from the society, they're a bunch of sci-fi fans. I can guarantee that 30% of them are gay and they probably have people of color in their group. And, you know, they're, they're, they're dedicated to the game and, uh, and what they created with the game because they were there playing and creating the world along with Barker. And, and you know, they, in, they interjected things that changed the world setting dramatically. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's really difficult. I think it's a really personal thing for people to decide how to cope with some of these older things that, that do have that weight. Um, I've heard of students of poetry refusing to study, is it Ezra Pound that was like a, uh, a racist also, but it's like the mo one of the most significant as far as poetry is concerned. If you want to do that, you should study this horrible racist person yes. because they were also brilliant in creating something that you might need to have in your arsenal of goodies as you proceed with trying to create your own works um so yeah it's just complicated you got to think about it think about how it how it feels to you i don't think storming around and pointing your finger and saying you're a racist because you're playing the racist game um and i've read all of the tecumel stuff for the most part i uh, read almost all of it and i mean it's it's so out there i don't see any racism in it you know um i never read one of the novels and it didn't seem really you know i didn't see um barker claims that everybody on tecumel is brown because they're 
um, you know, they've evolved brown skin. They're in the tropical areas of this, this hot planet. And so, and it's very sunny and you're going to get, you know, people with brown skin are going to do better in that climate and they will live longer and not die of skin cancer as easily as, as white people in a tropical <laughs> climate. So yeah, just by, you know, give it, I don't know, give it a hundred thousand years of natural selection and people are going to turn whatever is the useful color for that part of the planet. Um, and they're not going to change much. They're still just going to be humans. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I just, I get so tired of arguing about that stuff. I ran into, I ran into, uh, you know, Bill Hoyt was one of Barker's group players. Um, so, and Bill's a very affable, jovial guy and has no ill will toward anyone, but he's, he's been playing Tecumel since he was, I don't know, maybe 19 years old or something like that. And I ran into uh, uh, Victor Raymond, who was uh, part of the, uh, one of the groups. He wasn't in the first group, I don't think. I think he was in a later group that maybe started up in the uh, 80s that Barker was running. And so, and Victor Raymond has done, you know, he's invested a lot in promoting the world of Tecumel. He runs games at Gary Khan. He ran a Tecumel game at Gary Khan. Um, and I didn't see anybody rioting or anything because they were running Tecumel there. And um, he's really into the game. And, um, you know, I, as far as I know, he identifies as a trans person, whatever that, you know, that's a personal thing. Um, I think that's Victor. Um, um, so, you know, <laughs> what, I don't know what you're going to do with that. It's really hard. Um, I've, you know, I've looked through the original Dungeons and Dragons and there's a passage in there where Gary makes a sort of vague side comment that is definitely uh, anti-feminist. He refers, well, if, if you are a feminist, you know, then blah, blah, blah. And um, it's a commentary within its time you know, and, and uh, so you, I think you have to look at it from a her historical perspective. Exactly. Um, and so, whereas, you know, the, ga the people who are out there saying, like, well, you're gatekeeping because you're supporting it. And it's like, well, you're, you know, you're going to, you're lying to yourself if you erase the, tr the passages that existed in the game, but you're still playing the game. Exactly. Like, let's just take the game and we're going to erase all the bad stuff. And so now it's okay. And we're going to republish it so it feels better. It's got a shinier cover. It's like those, it's okay people it's that, okay uh, those people that uh, were saying that Lovecraft was problematic and they're racist, but they still want to play Call of Cthulhu. But they make sure right. to say that Lovecraft was a bad person. Well, if he was that much of a bad person, then don't play the game. Yeah. Because it's ridiculous. I'm playing this, this thing is created, but he was a monster. Yeah. I think it's, diff you know, it's, it's all this stuff. Um, I watch, you know, I watch other people's shows too. And um, it was Urbanski that had, of all people, Aaron the Pedantic was on their show. And Aaron was talking about his sort of online relationship with the guy that was um, this African-American guy who now has been, you know, called the evil enemy by all the, all the proper thinking purists. Um, but he had done a African-American themed game. I think I talked about it in the last show and how much I loved it. And how he was the first person to call me a racist on Twitter for no good reason. But um, I, I don't know. They had a really sensitive discussion about that. And I think that a lot of the people that are running around calling each other names and pointing their fingers are not being nuanced enough in, in understanding what's going I mean, it, on a certain level, there's really nothing to argue about. You know, things just are. It's something that happened in the past. It just, like you said, it's a historical thing. Um, I grew up all over the place i grew up in italy i will tell you that in italy the it, and it still exists the racism between northern italians and southern italians is is palpable at times and the racism between like um i was in northern italy and uh the northern league is kind of like an anti-immigration group and people think like oh they're against the africans and the and the you know the the Arab people and the, and, the, and, the, and the black Africans coming to Italy, they don't want these. And it's like, no, they have cities that are like full of uh, Eastern Europeans. They don't want those white people that aren't Italians coming here either because it's 
like their their support structure of of like nationalized healthcare and housing and all those things to help people in need cannot feed all of Eastern Europe, Africa, uh, and mm -hmm. and uh, the Middle East. I'm going to get a lot of flack for saying for making an observation of what they are doing and not criticizing it, but there's a certain reality there, you know. Um, and so uh, I don't know. I grew up there. I moved to the United States because my dad was American and we lived in the Midwest in the 70s. And um, my experience of what racism is there was frankly shocking to me, you know? And so, uh, so it's really strange to have these kids like, you know, calling me a racist on the internet. And it's like, you have no idea what real racism is. And, and this, and the, and the whole thing of like, I, I finally figured out I never understood for a long time. I didn't understand what this idea of harm was all about on the internet. And it really came down to the idea that certain people would just feel uncomfortable with something. And that something that makes you feel squeamish and uncomfortable is considered to be real harm. And, uh, and I was like, but when I was younger, like other kids would gang up and beat the crap out of me because I was the weird kid. Right. And I, you know, and I, it's like every day was kind of like a, I, I, it was like, you, I would worry like, God, is this another day when 12 kids are going to chase me? To, you know, I got really fast, going to chase me and throw rocks at me, you know? And it's like, so hearing a couple words and deciding that that is incredibly harmful to me, it's just, I'm sorry, but to use an old expression, it's like gross and balls here, you know? Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'll ask. That, I'll that thing was really start. weird. That uh, it seems that uh, that the what you were mentioning about uh, uh, uncomfortable things in the internet uh, being real harm. It seems that it yeah. uh, it's happened recently. Uh, five years ago, I I didn't notice it. I don't know if yeah. people were, were Maybe so sensitive. Maybe a bit longer, but I think probably these these kids and well, this generation. Well, I wasn't on Twitter. Yeah, they I was grew, on Facebook only. So probably yeah. because for us, we remember a time when there was no internet, so mm -hmm. uh, we can just disconnect and it doesn't resist. It's not the real world. But maybe for these people that has uh, have born with social media and social, uh, for them, it's real. They don't understand yeah. that they can disconnect. And they don't really need to exist. I, I don't just, know. That I, is the only. That is being nice. Yeah, but that, that yeah. that's that's not just that because uh, there was TV when I was. Uh, <laughs> there was TV when I, and when we were TV kids. And the offended it. And, offended yeah, you. You just, just shut it down and go. Shut it down. I don't want to see this. Okay, disconnect. I don't. You see, I don't get it. When I, in the seventies, when I the way they okay, they would the the schools were were even though they were not not segregated. The city where I lived and most of the Midwest cities were segregated. And so the government imposed this busing rule where they had to bus some of the black kids from the black neighborhood to the white schools and some of the white kids to the black schools. The way the city got around that was they would take all the kids from student housing where I lived because my dad was a, we were living in, my dad was a college or a, a researcher with the university, but we lived in college housing. And so all of us kids would get bused to the black school and so I grew up, half my friends were black, you know, and the other half were like this weird mix of Asian and Hispanic and like whatever, whoever lived in student housing, you know, all the other kids, that was my mix. So, so we were kind of the minorities. So it, all of this stuff is kind of, it's just like when they, when I get attacked on the internet, it's just like, you don't know me, you know, and, and I feel like a lot of people are getting that reaction. Um, I didn't want to get into all this social politics stuff though, because I'm just, it's done for me. Like I'm, I figured it out and I'm done. And if you want to, and if you show up and you try to get all like you, you're a bad person and you need to do this or that. I just can't, I just block you and I don't have to deal with you. Cause I'm not in, like, I, I worked through that stuff when I was younger, you know, and, and, and I think that most of the people who are running around being all anti all proper like that don't even have friends that are people of color. Whereas you know, my best friend, James, I met him when I was 16. He lives a block and a half from me. My best friend from when I was six years old, I still talk to him on the internet, you know? And it's like, and I'm not going to parade. I shouldn't, you know, it's, it's rude to parade your friends of color and, and, and sort of, uh, you know, like point them out. Oh, see, that's why I'm not a racist because I talk to these people because of their skin color doesn't matter to me, you know? And it's like, 
I don't know. They don't leave you any way to even get out of not of of being labeled that way by describing what your personal experience is. There's no, you know. So I'm just I'm just done with it. Um, I went to Gary Con. I looked around at Gary Con, and I will tell you that there were 2,600 people there, and I will tell you that the majority of them were white males. And, oh, how um, strange! <laughs> yeah, how strange! It's, just, it's still yeah, and so you know that's just gaming. I mean, I, I, I think that there was a guy who, an African-American guy who did an excellent podcast and he was talking about why black people don't play RPGs. Oh yeah. So that, know. yeah, it was the, great. The elite RPG or something like that. The name of the channel. Yeah. And he was just like, look, it's just not part of our culture. You know, yeah. our culture is focused on different things. And, and he was like, our culture is very focused on our church and it's a very conservative Baptist church. And so you know, D and D being branded mm -hmm. satanic for yep. one thing, you're just not going to play it. And also, you know, I think that there is a certain privilege in having the time and money to be able to play games instead of, you know, having to like my my buddy Eric had to he got kicked out of his home when he was 16 and was working it from that point on. My buddy Kurt was the same way. Like, like there is a privilege to having parents or somehow extra cash. Exactly, because the games cost money. It's a bit money. expensive. It's not yeah, it's on things that aren't food and shelter and, and clothing, like just essentials, you know. And so I, I, I tend to call them the white woke, you know. It's like if you're a woke person and you're out there being more hostile to people than people of color who, they got it figured out. They know what's going on, you know. You want to know about these problems? Just talk to people, you know. Ask your African-American friend, you know what's going it, on here it, it, and they'll be like i don't really agree with all of that yeah. you know the, the issue mostly and i believe this yes there is racism but the, pro the problem is social economical so until yeah. you solve the, the economical issue so there will always be because uh, if you're black and you are rich you will go mm -hmm. I'm pretty much convinced I'm that not going to have that much that much problem. So first, the economical yeah. is always first. Wokeness is being subsidized to <laughs> not uh, address the real problems. Because if you if if you just have to change your uh, profile picture, and you don't have to do anything else, so you just change right. The I could picture. just put up a BLM yeah. and a rainbow and like and everybody be like, you don't have to mm -hmm. waste money. <laughs> And then and and not follow. You know, I could get two accounts. I could have, have an account that follows Urbanski and Venger and you guys. I don't know. You guys aren't really yeah, we that are. caliber. You're just you are you're kind of no, getting I'm over kidding. that way more. Yeah, we don't talk no, about politics moderate. that much. Yeah, yeah we, we are. Um, we are we're not even um, American, so we cannot be. We're not in the same. Right. Uh, well, I mean, like the way we're just the interacting with the with the with the worst of with worst people. <laughs> worst. So no, no problem. You could have like FTG free the gypsies or something like or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, but I don't let's know. talk about gaming then. Let's, let's talk about. Yes. I, mean, I just that was the thing though. I got to Gary Con and everybody's having a good time, you know, and and I didn't see anybody being like left out of a game for how they looked. I saw people just thrilled to the gills to be gaming. Um, the camp, the conventions kind of set up. the The big thing that was going on was that they were having the masking thing, and we're kind of to the point where everybody's either had it, had COVID, or or is fully vaccinated and, and it doesn't seem to be spreading very much. So I didn't really feel like I was in danger. The hotel policy, it was interesting because the, the convention was very much virtue signaling safety because they wanted people to come. But the hallways between everything is hotel space. It's not considered convention space. They don't rent the hallways. And so the minute people stepped out of the rooms, they could take their mask off. And I noticed that most people in games, I mean, I was in a room full of a bunch of old fat gamers. These are the people that if anybody's going to die in the first wave of COVID, it's, it's, it's fat old gamers. And, and they had all survived it for some reason. Um, and we're all vaccinated. Um, I don't know. It was just, it was ridiculous. There's nothing to say there. The COVID thing is hopefully going away. Um, so we just had a blast gaming, but the majority of it is these rooms full of gamers playing RPGs. And I took, I went in and I took pictures. I would just stand at the doorway because I didn't want to put on my mask and take pictures. Because um, it wasn't as densely populated. There were rooms that were empty. You know, there would be like three tables of people. 
And I took pictures of people gaming and they were having fun. And uh, I just got attacked on, on uh, Reddit in an, of all places, an OD and D group for uh, making snide comments about 5e players, but they don't get that. I just, I don't give a crap what people play. <laughs> I like to make yeah. the snide comments because it's, but, but it's I mean, it's just it's like casting in the, what's that? I, what's that? It's funny. I just say it's funny. And, you yeah, know, you don't really, hilarious. you don't want to offend people, but you and can, they, you, the they play whatever yeah. you want, but you're going to make fun of them. These are, the people, <laughs> they don't, these are the people who don't actually play games. They just go on the internet and criticize people. Talk and then you it. make, and then they'll do like a semantic analysis of how you organized your words and what, you know, like, Yes, you know, and I'm like, but I use the word seemed, and that is not like an imperative. It seems seems to be a certain way is, is very vague, right? Um, um, I don't know. It's just the, the those people are idiots, you know, the people who really like to game are gaming. They're not wasting their time on the internet most of the time. And, uh, um, and then some of them who can afford to do it go to conventions, you know, um, I was surprised how cheap it was to go. I found a really cheap hotel, which I found out locally is known as the meth hotel because it was set on fire when somebody was trying to cook meth in their hotel room. And so I stayed there, but all I need is a place, it, you know, I'm at the convention until one in the morning. I go to my room, I go to sleep, I get up six or seven in the morning. I mean, I don't even sleep, if, you know, and, uh, and uh, I was delirious the whole time. I didn't sleep enough because I was just get up out of bed, go find some food find some coffee, go to the convention and hang out and talk to people. Um, there just isn't anything like it. I don't know. Do you know Xenopus uh, from Xenopus Dungeon? Have you seen any of his stuff? Uh, no, I don't think so. He's kind of like so. the big authority on uh, on Holmes Blue Book and, and the Holmes Blue Book Dungeon. And he published a 5e version of it. And um, um, I got to meet Zach and like, I don't know, like, you know, I'm not gay or anything. But I tell you, he's just like such a handsome, charming guy. If I was a woman, I'd be like dry humping his leg all the time. Like he'd never leave. I'd just be like, Zach. I just, I, I just loved the guy. He was so much fun to talk to and funny. And uh, it was late at night, and I ran into this other guy, Demos, who's a hardcore gamer. And he called me over, and he was with Zach, and they were talking gaming, and we all talked gaming, and and uh, everybody was exhausted and, and and sipping beers, but it was that sort of like. I don't know, you have one beer and you're so exhausted that you're sort of drunk anyway already. Um, I probably said bad things I shouldn't put on a podcast, but I had a blat, like, I was so excited to meet Zach in person and get to spend time with him. Um, I feel like he's one of those, I don't know, you meet people and you feel like, like, oh, this this person's gonna be my friend forever. Like there's some something there. And I really felt that way with Zach. He's just such a good dude. Um, other people I met, I mean, I just kept running into people that were nice people there. It's just, there's, you know, like I said, it's like these people that all they do is sit around and criticize each other. It's like, just find some people that you enjoy and, and that give you immense pleasure just to like listen to them speak and go do some gaming with them when they when they talk about gatekeeping is, is uh, oh, if the player does this, if the, well, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to play at the table with someone that would make me feel uncomfortable. So that is the thing with gatekeeping. You are you going to complain? Well, you find a group that match that matches uh, what you want to play. Yeah, and there were no cards or anything. Yeah, I mean that's what I, uh, you know, I I just warn my players. You know, we're going to get rough. It's playing the old way. The old way is brutal. And I ran my Thomas War Dungeon game. Um, I killed at least five players in that game in a couple hours and it's because they chose to go explore this room and you know it's it's sort of a it's a tr i always give my parties the, the in my demos they get the mule that is able to sniff out treasure but they're given a map and they're supposed to go follow the map and that will be the adventure and there are things along the way they can solve and interact with and and the story is to find out you know these secrets that they're being led to by this map um but the minute the donkey is like and starts pulling them toward a treasure every time the gamers are like let's go over there and it's like nobody leaves treasure lying around unguarded right it's the big treasure that the donkey wants to sniff out is gonna be it's gonna have something sitting on it 
And so every time I do that scenario, I've killed God like over 20 players doing that scenario. It's hilarious. It's they just can't resist. It's just, just, just bring them along. But what were we going to talk about here? Um, I think let's keep talking. And, I think it yeah. was precisely that. Uh, the old, Find, yes, and old finding D &D. people to play. Yeah, what finding you... people to play online, right? Because you were also saying that you were finding some hard problems finding players. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, my local group. Um, I wasn't. My last game session with our local group, which was, I think, it was before COVID, was so horrible. Um, of D and D, anyway. We've played other games since, but. Um, the experience was so bad. People were not engaged and uh, it just turned into this party. Like, like people were drunk, you know, and, and it was just like, guys, we've waited weeks to play and you show up and everybody just gets wasted. And maybe it's because we hadn't seen each other for a few weeks, but um, I kind of want to squeeze my, my gaming time into quality gaming time uh, and sort of compress it into a real good experience. And I put so much into creating this, this world of Blackmore as I see it, you know, as a, it's my own variant, obviously. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about finding players, to be honest with you. Um, um, I'm thinking maybe just hand picking people that I've played with already online that were capable of following along and, and were interested in what I'm doing. Um, I'd like players that um, we could do all the menial things like you know, we don't need to sit there together online while you pick through the equipment list to buy extra flasks of oil or whatever candles. Um, um, maybe get a group that is a little bit more engaged and wants to, they can send me emails and it's like, you know, we got back from the adventure while everybody's doing this, I want to do this. And I can write a little email and say, okay, this is what you find out, you know, and then they can email the other players and they can discuss things amongst themselves. I don't even know, need mm -hmm. to know as the referee what they're doing. Um, I might do something like that. Um, I don't know. I have, uh, I have mixed feelings on the whole RPG thing lately. I ran, uh, after running the war games at the convention and the RPG, like I love to invent RPG systems. Game design is really fascinating. So I like to create the tools that people might use in their games, but it's a lot of time to play an RPG and frankly, I still would rather get out the big nave led ships or, you know, get out the soldiers and play a big battle. Because to me, that's just as much an RPG. If you use sort of RPG methods of hidden movement and, and uh, minimal information, I just, I like that a lot more, you know. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to add. Do you have any ideas yourselves for what to do to get games going now that we're sort of moving to this online thing well, yeah, we, no. we already moved because yeah. um, we can't even if people we live uh, near we can't um, we can't uh, do anything um, live real life so yeah. we're playing online. COVID thing. no yeah. not, not, not even before that we can't uh, people are busy yeah, yeah they're busy it's, and um, it, en it ends up being easy just to have okay yeah. online everybody is at his uh, yeah. place are, if you so, have to consider uh, to join everybody at the same room it's it's difficult so better right just right. go online and, and do it well this works right uh, zoom yeah. works it's, for this is it an age thing though do you think yeah, I, I noticed uh most gamers i talk to you know you're you start when you're young you're in whatever age you are going through you know primary school even for all i know um up to when you go to college then you're in college, you might still do some gaming, but also there's other social stuff going on between um, all of the sexes. <laughs> um, and so, you know, people are busy with that. And then after you, you, know, you, get, <laughs> then you get a career, you get out of college, you got to get a job. I don't know if it's a career, but you got a job and it's hard to keep. I mean, I did some gaming in that period, but as soon as I had a kid, I gamed a little bit while I had a kid, but uh, raising children takes a lot of time. Okay, then mm -hmm. you have kids, then you have a family, then you have appointments. You have to do go somewhere with your kid or with your wife. Or, so mm -hmm. no, not that much time for, for gaming. But also and what I weird. saw... 
Oh, I was just going to no, say. No, no, no. I was going to say what I saw partners. online. Yeah, is that uh, yeah? What I saw online is that we have more time for quality gaming because we don't spend that much time uh, talking. Sometimes in the beginning, but I yeah. just tell people, "Shut up, we're going to play." Because Miguel, yeah, I always give people. He's like the game half an hour. He's the game master, but he doesn't do that. So sometimes people go for too long, and I have uh, to go okay. and say, yeah. "Okay, <laughs> let's play." Like you guys can, you know, you could just go have coffee or go have a beer somewhere. I mean, you live, yeah. It's not that big a city, right? No. Or are they all over the place now? Well, the, we don't live in the, in the same place as uh, all players, but uh, one lives very near. But he doesn't leave his house very much. <laughs> yes, I haven't seen the guy for years. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, the big thing I'm working on, actually, uh, I mean, I don't know what else we can add to that. I, um, I kind of want to, like, play with Banger just because I think he's hilarious, you know? I get a kick yeah. out of him. He's... he's He's funny and he's charming and I don't really care. You know, we don't agree politically and I don't care. You know, I just, he's fun. He's, the, we could get together and just not talk politics and laugh our asses off. Yeah, you still so going to go to VentureCon? What's that? Are you still going to go to VentureCon? I would like to actually. I think that would be hilarious too. But he said he doesn't do any war games there. And I'm like, come on, guy. Let me, <laughs> you know, I'll run some Fletcher Pratt and you guys will love it. You know, it's like, all the old RPGers have played like the micro games and little war games and Fletcher Pratt is just fun as hell. And I mean, everybody's learning. So I, I even told my players, I was like, we're, we're learning this game. You know, we're doing a, what we're doing here is like a play test. You're not even, you know, don't worry about winning, just observe how it works and, and think about how that had an impact on the games you play because it was created in like 1937 or so. And it's, it's part of our lineage, you know? Um, so yeah, I don't know. We'll see if, if Wenger agrees to let me come and run uh, a couple war games, you know, I'll be into that. But my big thing right now, um, one of the things I brought up with, with Zach, I was talking about the idea of, I really want to work more toward the whole concept of the living world idea. And that was something, uh, uh, you and I had talked about actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, living world was. We a... wanted to talk actually yeah. on yeah. the show. It's uh, it's taken an hour to get to this or however long. <laughs> um, but the living world concept, where you have a world where things are happening around you, and you do your thing, but things are happening. You know, you're getting, you know, the news. It doesn't matter what setting you use. But uh, Traveler did that. A lot of games tried to do that. Um, um, Judges Guild had the the. Uh, they had their journal of the uh, in of the Wilderlands of or the the Justice Guild journal, and they would publish along with all their articles that came in from just norm, normal gamers of variants and little dungeons and things. They would publish rumors for the for the city state of the Invincible Overlord and the Wilderlands of High Fantasy, and so you would get these things that you could you know pass on to your players of like. Rumor is that over here, you know, this country is invading that country. Um, and so, yeah, I've been really working with that. That's kind of part of what, uh, if in the first fantasy campaign that was published by Judges Guild for Dave Arneson, which is really the, the earliest, most complete source about Blackmore you can find. Arneson talked a lot about how the, the Blackmore campaign was to operate on multiple levels. And so one of the levels was that everybody had a domain and they played, they used the uh, uh, outdoor survival Isle on Hill game map as the domain game area, which was, I believe, just south of the Blackmore map. So they just all had their little domains down there where they fought wars and connived against each other um, in a very, like a mix between wargaming and Braunstein or diplomacy or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that's kind of what I've been focusing on doing is, is nobody's really bothered to address the need for an interpretation of Arneson's work in a way that can be used. And so, um, you know, people will disagree on how I go about doing it maybe, but my thing is just like, you know, I'll, I'm going to build a template for you. And if you don't like the way I handle certain things, then um, you're welcome to change them. Um, one of the things that I, when I was studying anthropology and I was kind of, I, I wanted to, to get a degree in uh, paleocognition. So I was studying really basic, like very simplistic ideas of how 
human consciousness evolves and um, uh, you know our consciousness is, is really centered on this idea of evaluating what things are and whether things uh, even what things are like I, I, I don't know I tied into like I had a friend who was a philosopher and he was studying AI back in the 80s and I ended up hanging out with him and the whole philosophy department of the university and the whole discussion was this idea of how does I mean it was I sat in on this sort of graduate level discussion of how does a person how, how do we differentiate the difference between a horse head and a cow head you know not even the whole animal just the difference between the those two things um because they were like well you look at the body you got four legs and a tail and a body and a neck and you've got a head okay so what's different in the head maybe the head is what it is and i mean we didn't have any answers it was just this big discussion and it was very eye-opening to me to think of in terms of like wow how does my consciousness even identify this as being what it is right mm -hmm. um um and so uh, uh the 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 big thing that you run into in, in human consciousness is, is the idea of groupings and our associations is one of the important things. Um, you study different species and they do have like really old species, we're talking about early hominids and they seem to have associations and groups. Um, and, uh, and if you study human expression, like, like their human expression is, is an international thing. It's ingrained into our being. Like, this is a smile, right? You can go anywhere on the planet and you can like, I can smile at you and you can smile back and we can feel good together. And, and I'm sort of saying like, yes, we, we are happy together. Um, or I can be angry at you and you can, ooh, he's angry. Hmm. And so um, one of the things that's interesting is these things are sort of polarized. Like you are not smiling when you are angry, mm -hmm. you know, rageful and you are not, and so uh, what I've been working on is this idea of creating like um, paths or, you know how in, in, in RPGs you have reaction roles. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I wanted to create was this idea of affinity between two parties and do like a map between all the realms. And so uh, what, you, what you have is, is like, a, like a graph, it goes both ways. And, and the closer your little mark is to the other person, the more you like them. The closer it is to you, the more standoffish you are. And so what I would create is a system where you start out with certain affinities. Certain people won't like each other. Certain people will. Um, and, and, and those affinities will determine your actions each turn. And so what you, what you do as a dungeon master, instead of having the players run the, the, the realms, you have this system where each turn you roll for affinities based on, on, on where the affinity is on that track from from indifference, you know, from like joyous, like we should get our children to marry so we can merge our realms, or we should do that, you know, to indifference, to outright war. Um, people are gonna do, do different things and based on what they do, you know, people are gonna react different ways. And so, and, and one of those things would be the idea also of, um, I don't really know, uh, outwardly you can show me an affinity. You can, we are allies. You can say, oh, we're allies, right? But maybe on your little, on that nation's affinity chart, really that is just part of the game. And, and they're like, you know, they're sending spies down. They're starting to, um, you know, do sabotage your, your economy or your military or your, your infrastructure somehow. Um, maybe they assassinate, you know, your best advisor. So now you don't have the right people helping you make good decisions, things like that. I want to create this, this system where you can sort of model the idea of affinity uh, or, or lack of affinity in order to create this world setting where the different realms are, are doing, are, are living sort of NPC, like the realms are the NPCs on this level, even if you're playing as individual people on this little tiny level. And, and what they do is affecting things that can affect you. Um, and so create more of a, a lot of what the Arneson players were doing was investigating like the Temple of the Frog. People think, oh, it's like a dungeon. You go in and you explore and you kill things, right? It's like, no, 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 no. That was a faction in the world of Blackmore. You were sent over there to figure out there's somebody down there, they're doing weird stuff. We need to find out who they are. You're doing 
a medieval equivalent of a commando raid or a you know or a CIA black ops mission into this place to figure out who these people are, what are they doing, what do they want, are they dangerous to us? Do we leave them alone? Do we have to go down there and exterminate them? Um, do we get bribed them or do we you know all of that stuff? Um, and so that's kind of the, the the level at which I want to start creating a system, which maybe could be universal to any game, really. Do you get to play the, the the upper guys, the upper level guys, or just the well, you know, that's kind of an guys. optional thing where maybe people could do that. Um, I think it would be interesting to do. A friend of mine tried to do that in his campaign, and I was all you know ready to go. I actually played two factions. One of my factions was the Orc Sewer Repair Union. You know, the orcs live in the sewer of the city and they repair the sewers and stuff. And I thought that was like awesome, you know, play that sort of the rule, the underworld, as it were. Um, and, and none of the other players could play at that level, which is, you know, that's that's what I keep. I guess I can't express to people how astounding the Blackmore bunch were when they created Blackmore because they they were able to be presented with these things that when you present them to the average gamer, they just, they just won't take it and run with it, you know, whereas uh, uh, this group of players in the Twin Cities, somehow they had, tw you know, like 20 people that understood, I can do anything I want with this, right? Um, so, I don't know, I've thought about doing the system as a dual system where you could play the realms. Uh, I find that most people don't want to. Um, and there's a certain level of mystery if you have a sort of an NPC system where you as a referee are just adjudicating what's happening. And uh, um, and so the players just get the results. They just find out like, you know, the North Tower, the, the, you know, we've heard that the North Tower has been overrun and sacked by the by the minions of the Egg of Coot. So the Egg of Coot has crossed the Great Water and is now on the continent and they're not that far away. Uh-oh, <laughs> you know, uh-oh, now we got a problem. Um, you know, like going to the dungeon is cool, but um, when they cut, you know, they're going to be here in a week. And, mm -hmm. and when they're here, we're not going to be going to the dungeon or anything because we're going to have really big problems to deal with. Um, so stuff like that, you know, um, and that way you can have players where they get in a small domain game. That's kind of the problem with some of the bigger domain games uh, that you run into is, is the idea of like making the players become somebody important. So in the small domain games, you can like Blackmore, this very tiny medieval world setting, um, the players can get asked to do things for the for the Baron. And it's like, you know, we the Egg of Coot is up there. We need somebody to go on a mission. You're gonna have to travel through this horrible place and risk life and limb, but we need you to take a message down to the dwarves and see if the dwarves are willing to, you know, they're sort of allies, we're not sure uh if they're going to come through but we need you to go down there and talk to them and convince them to send us help because if they don't send us help we're going to get wiped out and they're going to be next you know um and so that kind of makes these uh you know you get a more game of thrones type game going yeah, right? yeah exactly um and so i'm working on some systems but the the big thing is is i see people kind of to, to try to and that was when i was talking to zach he it's weird because I get triggered by words and he used one word, which I was like, procedural. He said procedural. And I was like, that's exactly what I'm working on is this like, procedural system. And um, the so problem- You get triggered, with... but not in a bad way. <laughs> What's that? You get, you get triggered, but not in a bad way. No, I get triggered Because you know, these days you use like, the word just... trigger. Yeah. <laughs> My head, like Zach was just like, I don't know. I just repeated a word. Other people are talking about procedural things too. And I was like, oh, no, no, you don't understand, Zach. I'm like, my head exploded and I'm like going, you know, I'm, I'm like running with this. Um, it, it um, uh, I don't know, it creates a, an image for me or something like, uh, you know, like a, like a smell or a taste can create an image. It's like words are like that for me. I like certain words just, it's like, yeah, that's a good sounding thing to describe what I want to do. I'm going to remember that. Um, and so the big thing is to try to create a procedural system that isn't too complicated and isn't too strict. Um, I think people want to write like computer programs on paper. Um, and I don't know, you know, what games you guys play. Um, 
but there are a lot, you know, you've probably played a lot of games, but there are certain games where um, the rules require, it's like a flow chart, you know, it's like, okay, roll this. Okay. You get this. Now you get this. Now you get that. And it's too tedious. And I'm more interested in a very simple idea of like this idea of the polarity of, of association, you know, am I your, do I consider you completely trustworthy that I would like sacrifice myself for you? Or do I consider you such an enemy that I will do anything to destroy you? Like, um, but the area, is in between and, and the actions that that nations take in between like do i send an ambassador you know as a gesture of goodwill do i do i send them a gift you know like oh i i, I sent you this beautiful gold goblet that my craftsman made and i you know i they made it it was so beautiful and it made me think of you and i sent it to you you know and so mm -hmm. you know hope to see you at the next joust you know um as opposed to oh I just found out somebody that I thought was on my side is sending spies and infiltrating my city with spies. What the hell is that about? You know, like you don't do that to your friends, right? Um, and uh, I mean, even looking at, you look at what's going on globally, like Putin's behavior, I don't want to go into the whole Ukraine thing, but uh, the Ukraine Putin thing seems like a very personal thing. Um, and so you're watching someone you know, people assume that nations should be operating at a higher, more sophisticated level. And yet what you're seeing is this sort of very personal uh, viewpoint of like, you know, this used to be ours, according to what I think. And so I must go down there and take it. Of course, the people down there are like, yeah, I've been here all my life and I don't want you here. So we're going to blow up your tanks. But um Global politics, you know, when, or especially when you read history and you go back in history, a lot of the, you know, history is driven by friendships and 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 people and friendships collapsing or or enemies or, you know, and and people just having to make a very uh, uh, clinical uh, decisions to tolerate people they absolutely despise, right? Um, so that's kind of, you know, I, I mean, I don't know what else to say about the system I'm mm -hmm. developing because it's sort of in process, but um, I think it's important. I don't know. You probably didn't watch my video. I never completed it because I had computer problems, but the demo I did of, of uh, Thomas Borg online with some people from Facebook or from Twitter. No, um, no. We didn't see that. Um, I mean, that was a good example of like referee adjudication and um, they got into a situation I really didn't have. I knew sort of certain touch points on the story and they're in the city and really it's turning into like a Cold War spy game. They're in the city. They've been contacted by this lady. Um, they know she's some kind of spy. They don't realize she's in the Assassin's Guild. The, the Assassins are really the spies in the medieval world. And uh, Va uh, Lavender, she was awesome. Like I got, a, I made up the character on the spot. Okay, you know, we'll never be called Matt Lavender. And this is what she'll do. But now she's in the game. Like she's becoming this sort of iconic character for my own campaign because she's somewhere in the upper echelon of the Assassins Guild. And um, they were supposed to meet her in a, or no, they had arranged. I won't go through the whole story. They end up in a tavern. They got to talk to somebody to arrange to go on a mission. Um, they were planted. That's what was happened. The Assassin's Guild arranged to plant them in, in good terms with the bad guys. So the bad guys was like, we need some guards. Meet us later. We'll tell you where to meet us so we can go on this mission. So they did the whole role play for that. And then the players were like, well, we're just going to hang out in the tavern and drink. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Right. So then I just decided, well, I'll roll 2d6 and see what happens. And I got high. And I'm like, well, high means that a battle, like a, a fist fight breaks out and the whole, you know, like an old Wild West punch up in the old cowboy movies happens in the tavern. And I was, you know, so I described that to them and I'm like, okay, everybody roll me a d20. And uh, one of the guys got a 20, you know, and so <coughs> I, I, I just, you know, you read your dice. I think that's something that I probably talked about it last time I, I, we got together online, but I think it's important to learn to read your dice and that the dice really, really can lead you into story ideas that impact the story, but don't kill players or anything. And I'm like, well, it's a fist fight. Nobody's got their swords out because we're in the city. You don't get your sword out unless you want to end up in jail or end up at hanged because you killed somebody in a bar fight. 
So uh, they can't find the guy who rolled the 20 after the fight. And I describe how like one guy's got a black eye and other, you know, they're all messed up based on what they rolled. And, and I'm like, yeah, you can't find him. So they say, well, we go out of the tavern. I'm like, okay, well, as you go out, you realize there's a body lying on the ground. And as you come closer, you realize that it's, it's your friend and, and his face is smushed, his face down into, into man, a pile of manure, you know, and he's unconscious and they basically like beat the hell out of him and smushed his face in manure and left him there, you know? And I'm like, okay, so you're going to take some charisma off for a while because you're really, your face is a mess. And you're, you know, you don't smell good right now, but it, it you know, the, that's kind of the, it, there's such a fine line in, in the game design for RPGs of having procedural systems that aid, that inspire you to create as a, as a referee and be creative in how you do your thing and systems that are so binding that um, it, it isn't really I don't know. It's more like a board game, even. It's not really role playing yeah. anymore. If the referee mm -hmm. doesn't get to create, we like right? rules light. Yeah, we don't like games that are very crunchy with a lot of rules. Yeah, then the crunch... you're just uh, reading. What do I have to do on this situation? Yeah, I don't that's, know. That's also the problem. Yeah. Uh, people can't memorize that, so you have to to stop to check it. So it's uh, it's bad for immersive uh, exactly. right. situations. Yeah, so that I kind of like with this procedural system, I'm thinking of more in, in terms of like, maybe people aren't familiar with what um, uh, like interpersonal or international conflict is in a campaign. So what I can do is I have these affinities and based on these affinities, these are the kind of actions that somebody might take mm -hmm. or not take, you know, um, based on how much they dislike their enemy, you know. Um, or like someone, um, you're going to do favor, you know, if you, you like somebody and, and they get attacked by their worst enemy and they send you a message and you're likely to be like, well, I'm going to go over there and mess those guys up. I'm sending troops. I might even lead my own troops there. We're going to come and help you, you know, because I can't, I can't just sit here and watch, watch you get trashed by these people, these infidels that are invading your country. Um, um, I don't know what else to say about that. I was trying to think if there was anything else mm -hmm. deeper about that, but um, just trying to trying to create a system that is simple enough to use and fast enough mm -hmm. to use for a referee so that every, uh, I don't know, maybe once a month of game time, you roll a die. Um, do you, what are you guys playing right now in your own group? Uh, you mean system or the, the genre? Sto genre, system. Uh, well, right now I'm not game mastering. We are uh, playing a, a short, uh, a short, uh, short campaign. On, well, not not really a campaign. Something smaller. Uh, it's um, it involves supernatural. So it's the system okay. we are using. Well, we are using uh, the gym system, uh, punk, which is a okay. it's a a retro clone for a game that that's not really popular. It's just called Action. Right. It's almost the same as Cyberpunk 2020. Okay, okay, but it's, it's just a clone version. It's basically, yeah, it's basically compatible. So it's uh, okay. what, what you are using. And it's written right in now. Portuguese, right? No, no, no. <laughs> it's in English. It's, it's in English. Yeah, there are no games written in Portuguese or from Portugal. Really? No, there are huh. written in well, Portuguese. The, Brazilian Portuguese. Yes, Brazil. I was going to say no games. Yeah, Portuguese. no games yeah. are translated yeah. to to Portugal Portuguese. Uh, Get with it. Translate some game, and you guys will be like the stars of the Portuguese. The only, thing. the only thing that was ever translated was the first um, box set, uh, the red box set. Uh, okay. Eighty. Well, it's eighty-four, I think. But it, is it a good translation, it was, or is it? I don't know. I don't. Re I don't remember. <laughs> I read it when I was uh, nineteen, I think. No, I was just curious about you know what you're dealing with yeah, with your no, campaign no. because yeah, now you know, it's even... not really a campaign. Now it's just a, a small. Uh... Yeah, we're, right. we're, we're always playing small stuff because it's horror, so it right. doesn't uh, it you're doesn't uh, it doesn't go uh, into a what you would call a real campaign. So characters. I mean, I run I run my Tonisborg like a horror game. You know, the people in my game were freaked out the minute they ran into it, like. I, I remembered that you can do this thing where you have compound events that are unrelated that just overwhelm players. And so while they're dealing with, 
they find, you know, it was a place they've been through before, the cur- or other players have been through before with the curtain made out of sewn faces. And they, and they lift the curtain and realize it's sewn faces. So that's creepy. And then they look in and, and there's just a hallway with a skull hanging on a string, turning slowly. And then one of the people in the back of the party feels a hand touch their neck. You know? And so they're like, to the, they're putting it all together and creating stories out of non disconnected <laughs> items. But it's like if that's what horror is. is like exactly. Yeah. You 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 know the trying to parse what is really the the supernatural and what is just something random. Um, but uh, no, I was just wondering because like one of the things that comes up a lot for a lot of gamers is the idea of how to track time in a campaign, and that kind of ties in with the what I'm trying to do with the Blackmore setting with the essential Blackmores. Um, you know, you have this higher level stuff going on, and you need to have a calendar where you're keeping track of where the players are in relation to the higher level thing that's going on. Um, and so I don't know how that ties in with exactly what you're doing, but yeah. one of the things that they did in the old, in the original D and D, they basically said it takes a week to recover from an adventure. And um, it actually makes sense that they did that. Um, and, and, and what it, what it meant was that people had multiple characters. So if you showed up and a week of time hadn't gone by and you wanted to go on an adventure with the other guys, you know, you'd say like, well, I'll just roll up a random fighter or something, or I'll play like, you know, so-and-so's got three henchmen, I'll play one of his henchmen, you know? And so <clears throat> you also got a greater number of, of, of PCs that were in the game. And so you had uh, a greater persistence of uh, this sort of institutional knowledge that that I use the term institutional knowledge, it applies well to the idea of the party. Like when, when you have games where they have reduced it down to like four people in the party, those four people collectively own all the institutional knowledge about all the adventures you've done in the setting and how, what is transpiring. Well, if all of you get killed somehow, <laughs> The campaign is over because nobody there's nobody to retain that institutional knowledge and so that's one of the things that i think is is a real justification for having a lot of pcs and having everybody maybe have a stable of three or four pcs Mm -hmm. that they keep around so that you can assume that between sessions they're talking to each other and so everybody's up to date on what's been going on and so if you go on an adventure and and some of you get killed they come back you know, or they just don't come back, then the remainder sort of know what they were doing and where they were going. And, and they know that maybe they need to continue in that direction as a collective. Um, yeah, um, those sense. are kind of like the big, the big campaign problems for referees. I think that a lot of referees don't talk about is, is how do you deal with time and how do you deal with institutional knowledge, party knowledge, um, and also this idea of the living world. Um, um, one of the things I noticed in, in, in Wesley's Brownstein is really interesting because at any point you can snap off a faction. And if you, uh, let's say you, we're going to have a cohesion die roll and, and, and people like people work in groups and research has indicated that a group of about 11 is a very stable group. Less than that or more than that can be really unstable. And so maybe you have a modifier based on the size of the group, but generally groups will, will fracture and won't retain cohesion. Um, um, and so you could have like uh, uh, any, any group, I don't know, the, the farmers union in your world, you know, they're the, they're the peasants group or whatever, or the, the, the middle class. Um, you, the, you know, you start the game and the middle class is happy. You're doing your searching for the searching the underworld. Meanwhile, the middle class is doing their thing, which is they've noticed that the uh, the price of, of consumer goods has gone up and they can't buy as many Barbie dolls and G.I. Joe dolls as they wanted to be happy. And they can't get as many microwaves and refrigerators and, you know, things are starting to get expensive for them. And so their quality of life is going down. And, for, you know, there's a lot of pressure on them to be pissed off at the government but what's even better is you can fracture and be pissed off at each other (laughs) and so you get a faction within this this demographic of your society 
and you know you roll a die and it's like oh i rolled high that means they really fracture you know and so while you're going about your adventures you suddenly have this other problem that you have this society that's sort of disintegrating on a certain level um and so yeah those are the kind of things i'm really interested in, in is these ideas of creating sort of modeling real human behavior and human group behavior uh, very loosely in a way that that you can experience it when you're playing your game as as like being in a real world you know um i don't know That's like the so living helpful. world in the the higher level of playing because i think some some campaigns uh yeah miss it if you're yeah. playing a long campaign or if you're playing uh in a world that is being affected by something okay so yeah you need that those events coming how is the world uh, evolving around you yeah yeah um So yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's stuff that Arneson was interested in when he was running all of his big Napoleonic campaigns. Like people think they were just war games and it's like, no, they were giant role playing games. They're playing the heads of state and you pissed me off and I'm going to come get you with my ships and armies, you know? And the same thing with Blackmore. It is, was originally played as a Brownstein game. Um, uh, you know, the stories of players competing against each other. I don't know if you heard my story about David McGarry's character um he he was uh the he basically was the head of the thieves guild and and uh he had his troop of thieves and he slowly came to realize that the other sort of criminal element was was Dan Nicholson who was the merchant who was really more like the mafia and he controlled every store in town and so when they'd role play anybody who went into any store they'd call over Dan Nicholson and he pretend to be whatever store maker who was her storekeeper who was part of his organization and he was ripping all the players off by charging them too much and stuff and so McGarry uh does a plot to steal everything out of the basement of the warehouse of the merchant and um um so that's a very brownstein style play thing and i don't know what other people were doing i'm sure everybody had some weird agenda and objective and they were all like you know they were 10 players in a room with a city on the table and they're moving around and talking to people NPCs and each other. I guess it's going to be hard to put that in a in a book because the Brownstein um, is very open, right? For what well, you, for David what Wesley see. has I think the only way to do that um it's sort of like trying to explain role playing. The only way you can explain role playing is by example. And so I think the Brownstein concept, the way you explain the Brownstein is through an example. And so I would say like, you know, working on the Brownstein book with Wesley, we will produce these, these prototype or yeah, these games, these playable games mm -hmm. with scenarios. And so people can read that as a way to put it together and run the game for their friends, or they can read it as a way to put it together and, and glean knowledge on how to make their, their regular RPG more interesting and more versatile, you know? Um, So yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know what else. I mean, was there anything else you were curious about, about these ideas? I and mean, we talked about it. I figured you had some of your own ideas about living world concept and how you apply that. Or... I was curious to know what your, what, uh, as um, <laughs> my experience, as I said, that it's mostly uh, short term things because uh, horror right. and sci-fi never yeah. expect, well, sci-fi can expand a little bit more, but uh, it never happened. Uh, around here, so I was uh, curious to, to know what you what were but you thinking. When you played the Dungeons and Dragons, you did feel that me, me, oh, you yes. missed that part, uh, right? No, not really. What 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 happened when I was, when we were playing is that we weren't really interested in the in the the dungeon part. We we're more interested right. in in the intrigue. So right. we quickly escalated that into um, a higher level game, a higher level game. Right. And uh, so we missed the, the first part more than the second. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps we should have um, played uh, <laughs> several characters, one per one per per player. It probably it would have, it would have been uh, better for that because we could play the the low level part of it and then the higher level. Even though we liked that that one better, uh, I never right. liked much dungeon crawlings. It's, um, I kind of have. I mean, I think it can be really good, but I just not. I don't want to do it every session. You know, mm -hmm. like, 
So it becomes punishment after a yeah. while. Anything when you do the same thing over and over is punishment, right? It's not fun anymore. And well, probably I could do that better because when I started playing, when, when I did the, the dungeon crawlings, we were basically starting. It was the first right. thing we played and we, we weren't uh, really good game masters. Uh, probably well, doing something rougher now or more um, aggressive, hostile. More, old, that, uh, more old school, I think. Probably it's okay. uh, yeah. Probably yeah. it would it would work better because that uh, dungeon crawling when when you're a teenager it's you're just rolling dice, killing monsters right. and yeah. The atmosphere. I mean, for myself, I remember you know my my big influence in that time period. There wasn't a lot of fantasy literature, so you know the Lord of the Rings and uh, Wizard of Earth Sea were kind of like the penultimate cool fantasy stuff I'd read and. I was trying to merge the idea, you know, we've got these two fantasy authors that are writing different ideas that don't, they don't blend together. And then you have D&D, which in its inception really just was like, they took a pot and just stirred everything together and you kind of had to make sense of it and it didn't really make sense. Um, and so, uh, but the thing I, I, you know, I liked about the Lord of the Rings and even Wizard of Earthsea is you have that element of you have a person who's doing things that are greater than mm -hmm. than just what is directly in front of them. You know, you have the party that the, the, was it nine of them, I think they went, they go off, they've got people chasing them. You know, there's not, it's not like a D like, you know, if you run an adventure and, and um, you are given an artifact and it's like, oh, cool. We have this really powerful, cool thing. It's like, no, the bad guys know what this is and, and they can kind of sniff it out. And, and now that you have it, they're after you. And so now you got to run away from the bad guys. Instead of going to the dungeon to kill the bad guys, you're, you're the dungeon and they're going to try to come and kill you for the treasure. You're, you know, you're the, you're the, uh, they're the murder hobos and you're the, the carnage. Yeah. Um, that's a nice twist, right? Yeah. And so then, and then, uh, and at the same time, the thing that you've got, you got to, take it over to the elves because they got the elves know about it and they're going to talk about it in their little valley home so you got to get to the elves you know and so it's like oh okay so and everybody knows that we have this now and there are people that are like yay you're going to bring us the thing and there are people that are like no we're going to keep you from bringing the thing um yeah i don't know that's it's just that was kind of the thing i wanted i think you can do that even in like you're talking about these smaller game sessions you, you don't have to i the big problem with our huge arc story is that it's sort of like tv series you, you know how they have the first season and it's really good and the second season they don't write as much and so they all the scenes are longer and they're stretching everything to get just get you through 13 episodes and a lot of dms do that and it's like no no, no, no just you know like maybe you know just kill that story arc in in four game sessions you know um um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of stuff like that that I think that, uh, or that I think about, and a lot of the, the game people that I like to talk to online think about is these, these ideas of time and, and how time applies to your game and these ideas of um, doing something more than buying a module where basically, you know, you have a map and when you get somewhere, the DM reads it and, mm -hmm. and the pantomime monsters and PCs come to life and do what the only thing that they're supposed to do, you know, either they're a friend or an enemy. There's no, this is not a real living world. It's just, it's something that comes to life when you- That's what uh, got me away from fantasy because that's basically, that's what, I don't know if that's what what most people play, but it's what people were playing. So um, I don't really like that. that uh, yeah. That was, I mean, I think Parker like that, was yeah. doing that with his players, you know, is that he had a, a very strong idea of what his world setting was. And because it was mixed fantasy and sci-fi, um, it was a lot freer. And, and I think that there's mm -hmm. a lot of, the tropes of fantasy are very constraining and kind of boring after a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, you're doing, are you doing like um, sort of Victorian horror or... Uh, it's not now. Uh, not, not. the one we're playing now. It's what, yeah, what is the right now? It's uh, what's the season? What is the 
18th century. Yes, 18th century. But it's not, not, century. it's not usual. It's just, just. A, yes. I'm not game mastering I'm, now. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm guy. writing, so I'm writing a fantasy. I already wrote yeah. it. We are going back to fantasy now. Yeah. So oh, really? You're going to write it? I wrote yeah. it, but it's, it's spaghetti fantasy. So it's going to be a sleazy setting and it's going to make fun of the, of the tropes. So, mentioned, okay. I mentioned that to you uh, a while ago. In, uh, on the, in the message. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Hobbit hookers or something like that, or is that more of your thing? Maybe, maybe there. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, but I'm who's going to run this? You're going to. Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to run. She's going to. Yeah. Yeah, she wrote it. We so. have a dwarf that is a sexual addict. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that Miguel I, said he's going to play that. I'm one. going to play the, the dwarf. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> a tattoo okay. sex addict dwarf. Yeah. And is it going to be fully medieval or? or uh, no, no, it's going to be a, a wacky world. It's going to be full medieval, but it's going to be a, a wacky world. So it's going to be a bit of sci fantasy there because I made, I was creating like the, this idea of these ancient gods and I just decided, okay, they are aliens, but nobody knows they are aliens. Right. Well, it's the Arthur C. Clarke. <laughs> yes, exactly. So they, yeah. it's obvious they're going to be, <laughs> the ancients are aliens. And so okay. magic is actually technology, but nobody knows. Right, but that's kind of what I do with the yeah, black yeah, yeah, yeah. Half the magic. Yeah, is... I think we can uh, uh, start. Well, it, it's right now. It's just a small scenario, but I think it, it can grow from there, and uh, just add stuff. So yeah, we don't know much about it. So yeah, it's it's, it's growing. It's, it's starting in, the... in a place. So, but let's okay. Let's add this. Uh, what what happens that in another country or in another yeah, and that continent. is that is the part that is interesting because I always was a bit put out by fantasy also especially as a, but when I started uh, going more into role plays and only started interviewing people I st realized that okay fantasy doesn't have to be just high fantasy because I get bored with high fantasy so right. yeah fantasy can be horror it can be murder mystery it can be you put a bit of sci-fi so fantasy can be a lot of things right right yeah, I'm kind of looking for a different, a new trope. I just feel like I've kind of played it all. That may be my thing. I mean, I really, I love a good game. I don't care where, what it's mm -hmm. set in, but um, I, you know, most people do the store-bought trope and the store-bought world setting. And most of them are sort of, are so highly derivative yeah. that there isn't a lot there to explore that's exciting to me anyway. Um, I don't know. What are you guys playing? Well, it doesn't. Uh, this one hasn't started yet. Uh, we, we're gonna play it once, once uh, so a month when it started. I'm, I'm like, um, sort of like yeah, uh, on uh, uh, Sundays. To... Sundays? <laughs> yeah. What time on Sundays? Uh, well, for Even us around uh, yeah. for <laughs> afternoon for us, uh, night for us. That I mean. Yeah, it's probably afternoon for you. It's uh, we would normally start uh, an hour from no half I'm an hour. I'm not sure your your time now. zone is. Uh, What's your time zone? I'm Riffin. mountain town. I'm I'm uh, mountain town. You I guys think are it's... the same as England, right? Yeah. Yes. We I think are it's seven hour time. difference. I think yeah, it's, it's like six. depending on the time shift. Yeah. We do that stupid time shift thing. We do. The, we do else. that. Yeah, we also we yeah, also we do, do that. that. Oh, okay. Just, okay. We just, just change. Okay, change, so uh, so it's I think, always seven. It's about I think we are still yeah we are still in the seven hour difference. Yeah. So if you start at say I don't know when we are we are starting usually we start about eight thirty. So, so oh. 8 30 p.m so it would be after lunch for you i think probably yeah it'd be about 1 30. yeah 1 30. i don't do anything on sundays <laughs> okay you so... need an extra player yeah we're welcome on an extra player you're gonna or, make me i'm gonna feel a lot or pressure. an extra game master perhaps yes. oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just fun to play yeah okay yeah. Uh, well let me just play it at one session and then you guys yeah can you can you can play but i'm island. gonna be no i'm just worried about me as a game master because i'm not very experienced but actually the thing that went better was uh, when we played the witcher because i used the sandbox model because i tried game mastering with a store-bought uh, campaign it was awful because right. players like miguel they always do the thing that will ruin yeah, the campaign. let's let's not mm -hmm. uh, let's not bad mouth um, bot campaigns because that's what I'm doing. <laughs> yes, but you are doing story seeds, but your bot campaigns are different. Yeah. So they have yeah, they uh, basically a bunch of plot hooks there and people can do whatever. It's not you do this and no. then you do that and then that happens. Right, it's yeah. not, it's okay. No, I, I do sandboxes, there are, there are no scenes. There are, there's a, uh, well, no, usually what I do is there's a place, I describe the place, I describe the cast that lives there or works there or 
dwells right. there. And then I put a lot of uh, plot hooks there, connections between uh, possible players, NPC. So now it, this is the events is, that can happen. Yeah, so events if that can you want happen. to play this story, this will happen. So take it and do what you want with it. I mean, I've, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. Most people are good DMs. It's just what, you know, what the story that's presented and the possibility that's like I played in a game and, and I was really excited to get playing again. I always tell the story and, you know, I, I was like, I'm going to fat like we keep traveling for three days to go on an adventure in this dungeon. Why don't we just build a place to live? So I took over this, this uh, ancient tunnel through this mountain and I started, I hired dwarves to carve more tunnels and I created this town inside the, the front of the mountain with windows and, and also a courtyard with a wall and a little town below, but we could run inside and close the iron gates when the when the dragons showed up because there were these dragons that moved across the valley from us and had wiped out the town and and uh that was already there and um the dungeon master's response to me wanting to do that was like well you're not high level you know it, in the rules you're supposed to be like six level before you do that and i was like what you know i've got three thousand gold pieces and that's enough to buy a house according to the rules i'm gonna buy one of I'm going to build a house, you know, like that's the sort of stuff that pisses me yeah. off is when I'm limited. If I get into a campaign, the, your biggest problem might be too many emails, you know. But, the only uh, thing is that, yeah, in this game, you're supposed to play a bastard. So you're supposed to play an anti-hero. So yeah. no good guys. No good guys? Well, they are good guys, but they're, not, they're going to be the good guys, but they're not really yeah. that good. So. Oh, wow. Gray areas. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that's going to be a, a big, a big success. What time setting is this? Is it medieval? Uh, it is medieval, not, not mostly, quite. Well, but not completely. It's not. It's not placed on Earth, so it's. So uh, yeah. It's some fantasy right. world. Oh, it sounds interesting. I don't know. They, you know, keep me in mind. I wouldn't mind coming. Yeah, we will. We'll send you the, the invites. Just if you hate it, then don't don't bet mouses. <laughs> I won't. I won't. I promise. No, okay. Don't cancel well, us. The other thing I yeah. do is I, I do lose interest, and it has nothing to do yeah. with anybody else. It's just like sometimes I like to play like three sessions, and I'm like, okay, I just I'd rather just lay around and be fat. Than to go play. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. I don't know. I hope maybe all these ideas I'm talking about, you know, like the idea, like uh, it's interesting because computer programming and game design are very closely related. Like the way they work is very closely related. And even like the creation of adventures is so closely related. And so like what you were talking about, like the, the sort of the sandbox setting, I, I do kind of like the sandbox and I have certain ideas that are developed and I will railroad my players into going in those directions like the little girl that shows up and tugs on you know and then once you get immersed in this story and you're given a map you yeah know, you can go do something else but um but um the idea of like the recur i mean the adventures are always sort of a recursion you know it's always it always you find out about this thing and it's over here so you go over there and then these things i mean it's always there's always the logical there's always the logical and reasonable uh, conclusion of whatever you did before that leads you to the next thing. Uh, I don't know. I th it'd be fun to play, you know. Um, is there anything else we want to talk about? I feel like we wasted so much time talking about all that social justice stuff. I'm just so tired of yeah, it. Yeah, we know? always uh, well <laughs> go off the topic. Just yeah, yeah. that's that. We, you can't uh, we can't run away from that, mm -hmm. especially if you are on Twitter. You're dealing with that daily on a daily basis, yeah. so it's very difficult to run away from it. And I don't I go it. into uh, arguments with people, but when I see this, some tweets like "this is so stupid," <laughs> I'm just going to right. ignore it. Right. Yeah, I've been I've been kind of a boy. I, well, what I really want to do, we've been doing ads for the movie and ads for the book, and so I really wish those were doing better because then I might like drop off social media a little bit and just do my own thing i have plenty of other things to be doing you know um if you're creating stuff i mean this 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 setting you're creating is interesting you should look you know take notes and consider organizing it after you run it and see if maybe you can publish it or something are you no, we are. Of anything? We, we are. We are. Published. Going to be we published. are. Yeah. 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 Without, oh, okay. yeah, without to, to testing it before because it's just uh, like that and then <laughs> we'll see what happens okay yeah, yeah well, well i can uh, tell you 
So I was uh, published in English. Yeah, of course. Always. Yeah. And I I then I don't even think about publishing in Portuguese. Everything yeah, it wouldn't be uh, it would be a waste. So the everything market I, is very small yeah, in rubbish. No, no, I, unless I was writing in, in Brazilian Portuguese, uh, and I am not, so I don't think they they, they can even really uh, understand it i think it's it's different it's, oh, really? it's very yeah, different it's, yes well they it's can understand it dialect, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's, it's grammar they use yeah, different, the problem is grammar. Uh, yeah they have they use different uh, verbal time uh, is it times that you say i don't know they use a lot of what is the tenses, ink form yeah, tenses, tenses yes yeah. they use a lot of the ink of the equivalent of the ink form in english but in oh, portuguese yeah. it's very strange yes we but also portuguese from portugal and they also uh, vocabulary vocabulary we have words that are completely different so right. they, they can right. understand but it's uh, in the same with us it's it's strange you have to put an effort into it into it so i mean we talked about this last time we talked because i speak italian and yeah i'm i'm from i mostly i'm i'm from the uh ver, like uh uh verona area and then on the border like uh friuli and so i know those dialects and then i go to other places and I'm, I mean, I just cannot, you know, and then we have, and then so we have this common language that we all use that we call Italian, which they claim is closest to uh, the uh, um, to Tuscan, right? And, uh, but you listen, I go to Tuscany and I'm like, no way. But I know that the region I'm from is really weird because there's that whole like, uh, the, the difference between saying like, I have yo o. And, and, and in, in my dialect, you just say go. I have it, go. You know, you don't say io, go questa roba, qua. Or, or uh, the, I was talking to Sarah about that. I was just, I mean, it just tickles me. They have their own words for things. Mm -hmm. that, and then being on the border of Slovenia, you get all these Slovenian words in there too that we use in, in, in Galiziano, which makes it this incredible pastiche. And it's funny because when I go there, they all assume I don't speak Goriziano and can't understand it. And I'm like, dude, so my mother was Goriziana and I lived here as a kid. Like, you know, you you spend several years of your life learning that you just learn it, you hear it and you learn it. I may not speak Goriziano very well, but um, um, I'm trying to think of the other ones that are funny because it's like, I don't know. It's just interesting to me that you have these expressions that totally change, you know? We even have so it inside I, the country, but not that much because Portuguese as a language has been uh, very well in Portuguese, Portugal as a country. So it existed before Italy was a united taught, country. Yeah. So it is it is different. But there is a big difference between the Brazilians. And it's strange because yeah, it's the same language, but yeah. it totally changed there. Have you seen that that TV show series um, based on uh, Ellen? Is it Elena Ferrante? I think it is my my brilliant friend. Like I see, I like to watch TV shows that are in dialects that I don't understand, and it's all in this Southern Italian dialect. No, I haven't it, watched that one because we normally haven't seen. We haven't been watching a lot of recent TV shows. Yeah. Oh, okay. We'll well, check that one. We are only watching old stuff, not not new stuff. So you know what? There was a. a there was a, an Italian TV series that's sort of this mafia thing. And I never liked mafia settings. Like I never liked the American mafia movies. Cause I, mm. I sort of had a, a disdain for them because it was sort of like the dark side of Italian culture, you know, like these are the bad guys in the Italian world. That, in that the eighties, there was a like. very popular uh, TV show, the La Piovra. Oh really? Yeah. It was, there's, it was very popular. There's, there's a new one called Suburra. And uh, there's a TV series, but mm. there's also, yeah, I think it's a TV series and a movie, but the TV series, I just, I've started watching it and it, it has a certain Shakespearean quality and it, and it also like you watch it and the plot lines and all the little mm. twists. I was like, this is like such an incredible source for an RPG setting. Yes. That's I why think I, it, uh, is it a, a period series or a, a contemporary? Yeah, and I think it might happen in the 90s or something. I think I got that one recommended by by a colleague, but since oh this is a new TV show, I'm not going to see it. <laughs> right. No, it's <laughs> but really makes good. sense because her boyfriend well, is Italian, Italian it's different. and uh, it, uh, her boyfriend is Italian, so yeah, and she's oh, American, yeah. so well, yeah. What we are avoiding. What, what we actually are avoiding uh, is Marvel American and, and the... English TV shows. Exactly. Yeah, not, not okay. just that. Yeah. American yeah. and English TV shows because they're all woke now. 
So there's right. you have the diversity right. and the themes that have to be. And you have no story, and it's boring. And there's no story, yeah. Right, you forget all that. But we watch the we watch the new TV show, a French a French one, the yeah. Paris 1900. I think it's about. Um, well, with the police uh, yeah. in in France in 1900s. Yeah, I think. Oh, really? It's about yeah. um, the, the well, several things that, that were happening. What's it called again? Paris 1900, I think. Paris police 1900. Okay. Yeah, it is part in real in a, a real story. I think I might have seen an episode or two of that one. It was it was kind of popular, I think, when it when it started. Well, it's just on a, a just one season. It's a mini series, okay. I think. But anyway, I just get a kick out of these, you know, because I speak Italian, I really get a kick out of these these dialects. And so when I watch uh, Sugura, I'm just like, I I understood half of what they said. <laughs> You know, and it's and half of it is slang too, and uh, like street slang, like modern. I mean, it might be the two thousands, but my favorite character in that show, there's this one character that is a gypsy, and he's he's this young gypsy guy, and you know the gypsies are all about machismo and whatever. Well, he happens to be gay, so he's got to keep that secret, <laughs> and he's and he really doesn't want to be the mafia leader of his tribe. All he really wants to do is go to the club and dance and party. And so, uh, I, I don't know, it's just like a fascinating character because they're not doing the, the whole woke thing of like, everybody's gonna yeah. come to accept the gay guy, right? That he has to figure out how to like, be the, the macho mafia guy for them and also be able to do his other life because that's the real world, you know? You're not gonna change your society. And, um, and so, yeah, that's a, to me, that's an interesting character, you know? So, um, I don't know, I'm kind of fading out on you guys, I think. I mean, we covered a lot of stuff. Yeah, Do yeah we've, been, we've been going for a long time. Yeah, okay. I just you always are ask. always, yeah, you're always a good source of stories. So we just, oh. just you know, I, see, talk. I worry that I just, <laughs> do too much of that you know okay. i get on shows and i can well if people don't want to watch they, they, that, they're you know? not uh, they're not obliged to watch till yeah. the ending they just can okay. watch the first hour or something or just jump well, to the ending <laughs> can i do a product pitch for my oh movie yeah yes of course that? do it yeah you can see the movie on secrets of blackmoor on Am is now on amazon again um we prefer if you watch it on vimeo because vimeo gives us a bigger cut of the mm -hmm. profit and we're on vimeo as well and um, I think you can still buy the DVDs and on our website, secretsofblackmore.com. And then we also are in the process of taking pre-orders. We're going to print the second printing of, of The Lost Dungeons of Tonisborg, which I showed earlier. It's somewhere in this. Uh, here. Uh, got piles of stuff. But um, this is Greg Svensson's uh, Lost Dungeons of Tonisborg, which is... Um, sort of a, a combined, well, we have maps. These are the original maps from 1973, photocopies of them that we found. Um, and it, it is, as far as we can tell, one of the first four dungeons ever created in, in RPGs. So, um, and it was lost for a long time and now we found it. And, um, and it just talks about traditional role-playing techniques and how to do a lot of stuff we've been talking about Mm -hmm. um, to, with the show here, um, these ideas of how to approach role playing as, as uh, I don't know, just a different, much more experiential way of playing than, say, things that are based more on video games. Because video games came from paper role playing games historically. Yeah. So we can claim that. Um, anyway, thanks for having me on the show. I You're always welcome. enjoy talking to you guys. <laughs> Thank um, you for coming. So you invite me to play. I yes, we, game. we are going yeah, to invite you. Yeah, now I'm gonna feel I'm gonna feel the pressure. I'm gonna have two game masters in just my just in drink. my game. No, yeah. Sylvia, just drink drink a lot before you play and you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have an advantage, you're a woman, so yeah. Yeah. That is you, have to, you have to be nice, so I have to be nice <laughs> can, to her, yeah. yeah, I don't want people yeah. to be nice to me just because because of that. So oh uh, yeah, you're a girl. Yeah. No, and, uh, no, no. I mean, <laughs> no. I just want to have fun, and and yeah. And you, it I and hope it, the game the game is fun enough. So it's sleazy, and you can do. <laughs> and okay. our players, uh, well, at least Miguel and one of our, our uh, other players, uh, they love one. to do things. As yes, another bastard. It loves to do crazy things that they're not really? <laughs> not supposed to. Yeah. So. <laughs>
Well, not that crazy. Not no, that crazy, sure but anything. We're online, so no, there's no yeah. problem. Right. Well, are you doing, um, like, do I generate? We'll talk about this off. Yeah, uh, we, I'm yeah we're going to stop the recording. Okay. So okay. The, uh, thank you for coming, and we have to. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to well, schedule Griffith. something else. What do I say in we're going to shut Griffith up. Uh, Adios. Well, we can, Adios. you can say Adios. ciao. Yeah, you can say you ciao because we have ciao. We also Adios. use that. <laughs> oh, well, I can't. Yeah. I need to have you guys teach me how to swear so that when we end the show, I just say something like a porca putana eva. And you're uh, like, we're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> ciao, guys. Ciao. ciao. Bye bye. Bye.